get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more. This is part of the Pro Podcaster series, where we talk about the behind the scenes of how pro podcasters work. Today, we have Colt Cabana. He is the longest... Hey, Colt. He is the longest running wrestler-to-wrestler podcast in existence and he's been doing the Art of Wrestling podcast weekly since 2010. He's interviewed people like CM Punk, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and many more. He's been entertaining crowds around the world, literally, as a professional wrestler for over 17 years. Australia, Canada, Europe, Japan, Mexico, all over the U.S. And he even wrestles in cult underground places like Insane Clown Posse's Gather- Gathering of the Juggalos. And he's been featured on Mark Maron's podcast, and he has a cartoon version of himself as a billboard off the highway here in Chicago. Colt, thanks for joining me. Um, thank you. Glad to be here. Good to see you. How are you, my friend, Jeremy? Yeah, Dr. you know, it's Jeremy. funny because I don't know why I did a lot of research for this, and I was slightly nervous uh, to, to chat. And I don't know why because I've known you for years. Um, but Literally years. Years. Decades. Oh, yeah, over probably over 20 years. <laughs> um, you know, what I was interested in, one, is I want you to describe the scene, Who anyone who hasn't been to an insane clown posse gathering. What is that like? Well, I mean, just to jump right into the podcasting world, you can hear me document the whole thing on Howl.fm where I have an audio documentary about it. So you can hear, actually hear the whole thing. This is uh, coming up in July. July 21st uh, through the 24th, I believe yeah. I'm going to my sixth uh, gathering of the Juggalos. I've been performing there every single year since uh, 2010. And what do you do it, there? I wrestle. I'm a prof- I, I wrestle yeah. there as Officer Colt Cabana. I'm a bad guy. Uh, the, 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 it's kind of always funny how as a police officer, I'm the bad guy. But in the world of the, the Juggalos and the Insane Clown Posse, of course I'm the bad guy. I'm the police officer. So uh, I go there and work. They have a wrestling promotion there. But as part of uh, Insane Clown Posse's wrestling promotion, um, I also get to go to their gather, which is their biggest thing. And if you want to talk about uh, – I know it might sound weird. You know, Here you are. You know, Somebody's looking or listening to a, a podcast you know, about – you know, uh, entrepreneurial, but they're the ultimate entrepreneurs, yeah. and they. And if you don't, if you if you laugh at them, you shouldn't. You should look at their business model because they uh, have their music. They've been going twenty plus strong years. They put on a million dollar gathering every single year. Wow. It's it call you know over a million dollars to produce this thing. That's and, um, It's it's amazing. Where is it? it or is that a it, secret? It, no, no. It used to be in Caven uh, Caven Rock, Illinois. They moved it to Short, uh, Thornville, Ohio. And they're based out of Detroit, Michigan, and they, uh, I mean, they, they do everything in house. They make everything happen themselves. So they are such inspirations, and that's why I love going there. But you go there, it's like Woodstock for like the weirdos and the misfits, uh, uh, you know, beyond. And I don't say that derogatory, right, right? Because I love it and I brace it. So I'm there. It's a, uh, you know, they, they have music. It, it's like a music festival, and then there's just like, and then add just all these people that. That people make fun of and 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 rip on their whole lives, three hundred and you know sixty days a year, and for five days they get to come and they get to be normal. And I love seeing that community. Pardon the uh, train running. Mean. I love seeing the community of people being in a place where they can be themselves. That's the L they... behind us, by the way, right? Yeah, that's yeah, the L train. <laughs> We're both uh, in Chicago, but uh, Skype to Skype. So, um, so they come a, together. It's about a community, and yeah, it is like wild, and there's a lot of drugs going on, and there's a lot of different interesting people, but it's about a community, and I love that community aspect of it. What do you think made it into such a cult following? Because there's a lot of bands that you know come through, and obviously people follow you. It's it's sort of a cult following with uh, the art of wrestling, and and even the the independent wrestling leagues too. Yeah, I think it's their hustle. Like they they were just like crazy hustlers and it was something different. 
and, and I think that maybe there's something different is almost the most important thing is that you have to stand out. And obviously, they did, they did, and they started as the Inner City Posse. And I actually had ICP on my wrestling podcast because they were in WWF. Really? WCW. Yeah, they were wrestlers uh, I for had a long no idea. time. Yeah, they love wrestling. They, they're, that's, and that's why we get along so well. Uh, they started as the inner city posse and then like they just knew they needed something different and something crazy and and one of the guys they had on on the stage was dressed as the clown and they loved it and then all of a sudden they you know they were like let's you know violent jay and shaggy tudor were like maybe we should try it and so like the clown aspect and and the gimmick was so different that they stood out and then they hustled hard and they found yeah. their own thing and they found their own niche and and once you find your own niche like people dig it it's inspiring to people and i think that's kind of what what Turned them into, uh, I think that was the start of the cult status. Yeah. And then you got to assume, like, everyone hating on him so much, um, everyone fights for an underdog. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Why like, were I people hating that. on him? Because they're different. Yeah. And different weird, you know, not different how society, like, labels us uh, as normal people, you know, just uh, different different people from what society cons- uh, considers the norm. Yeah. And, um, and, and they still fought and fought hard. And I think that underdog aspect helped a lot. So and how, I think it helped. It helped. Like helps. Like I know I look like a normal guy, but you got to understand. Like what I do for a living is very weird and different by societal <laughs> societal norms. And I think like, even though I, I, me and the ICP don't, we're not, we don't have the same like shtick. You know, it's kind of this. It's from the same bubble. I think. Right. Well, it's funny you say that, Colt, because um, so I went to one of your matches. I think it was in West Chicago, uh, like a, I, a, lo- a long time I, ago. I thought you were gonna say I went to the gathering. I went to the gathering. No, no. <laughs> I should wear my white coat, like when I stick out. Um, no, I went with my then girlfriend, now wife, and and I, I don't think I warned her enough about what was going to go on. So we just kind of sat down in the crowd, and then you know, you and the, your opponent proceeded to go into the crowd, and there's blood everywhere, and the camera thing is shaking, and she's freaked out, and afterwards she's like. You know, was that I go, that was real blood, yeah, and and she was just freaked out for like the whole night, like like shaking, like this is scary stuff. She, but uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's different. Well, that 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 match particularly was very different from what I do, but the atmosphere isn't, and that's a thing that you wouldn't have known to come to or take your girlfriend to unless. Uh, unless you knew me and you did know me and that's some underground stuff, you know, like it was at this, uh, you know, it was at this, um, whatever it was, the, the, the rec center, you know, in Chicago and, and we do these shows all over the world in these, uh, weird, weird places. And, um, and it's kind of like you have to know to know and a lot of people on the outside and that's kind of what makes it a cult like thing is that. You have to put in a little work to find it, and uh, and you found it through me, yeah, yeah. and you realized that this was a different, different world than uh, what yeah. I'm used to going to yeah. barbecues and, uh, <laughs> and 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 brunches, you know. <laughs> right. So, how did you first discover that the uh, gathering of the Juggalos? Did they approach you? Did you ask them? No, I, um, they they've been doing that wrestling. Uh, they they originally put out a thing called Strangle Mania in like 1999 on VHS. Yeah. That was actually a big hit within like. Best Buys and Circuit City, and that was another cult thing. So I, I've known about them in wrestling and and their kind of uh, niche in wrestling for a long time. So when I got fired by the WWE in 2009, you know, um, uh, a friend of mine reached out saying that they were looking for a police officer character, mm. and 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 this friend, the friend uh, was known as Weed Man. That was his wrestling name. Uh, he 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 thought I would be a good fit for it, and uh, I thought I would be a good fit for it too because. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. I was I was leaving the WWE. I was going back to what I had made my living on previously, which was weird, wacky, independent wrestling. Right. And I thought, what a great jump! Yeah. Um, what 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 could be a you know what could be a better jump than jumping in feet first with the insane clown posse and the gathering <laughs> jugglers? Exactly. Yeah. And I want to talk about some of the craziest places that you've wrestled. Um, but I told you I would not be nice to you on this. But um, but I have to just respect and what i respect most about you cold is um the hustle and you're always hustling you're always working hard even even though your face is on a cartoon you're a cartoon on a billboard you know it took uh anyone who's gone to your match who knows you knows you hustle your you know uh your butt off and um to make things happen 
And uh, you got to respect that. And just the abuse your body takes, um, <laughs> you know, on a uh, weekly basis is crazy. 17 years of that. I mean, mm. you need your body to work. I don't even know how you've survived. Your body survived this. Yeah, it's physical. I mean, it's a, like I, I have a lot of uh, friends and, and my art form is very similar to, to traveling bands and traveling comedians and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and I talk to my, my, my friends who are in those industries, <coughs> pardon me. And, you know, I, it's always like, it's kind of the same thing as we have to hustle. We have to get our name out. We have to have a voice. Uh, we have to, you know, we have to figure out how, how we're going to move up in our, in our industry. But also on top of that, I'm also throwing my body around. Oh my and, God. That's and, an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> nonstop, um, into everything and anything. And so that's, yeah, that's one of the big, uh, I guess, risks, but also, you know, that's part of the job. It's what I signed up for. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, I, you know, you can't, you can't be a pro wrestler without doing pro wrestling. You know, luckily for me, I'm smart <laughs> enough where, uh, I, I've, I've changed my style a lot over the years. You I have? Do, How yeah, so? I, do, I do a very comedic based pro wrestling style mm. and, um, you, you know, that allows me to take a lot of, uh, I, I don't rely on the hard, um, you know, the hard hits or crashing the mat necessarily. Right. I, re I rely more on um, the entertaining and yeah. showmanship and that kind of thing. Yep. And that's allowed me to save my career uh, a long time. And yeah, I'm 36 right now. I've been doing it over 17 years. This is my 18th year in wrestling. Yeah. Wow. And I, could, I, I feel I could literally do this competitively at a high, you know, at a high uh, level for another 10 years. Yeah. And then after that, at a lower level for another 10 years after that. So what's the craziest place? Because you go into these different environments, right? What's the craziest place that you wrestled? I think the craziest place was when I went to India. And uh, we wrestled on a, on a dirt patch uh, behind like kind of like a – it was supposed to be a trade show. But, you know, it was, it was like really just like a dirty flea market in India – and Gohate, India, which is the uh, northern western part of India. So you've heard horror stories of what India can look like in the poverty. And e yeah. even even in the places that are, like, beautiful, you hear the horror stories. Now go away from anywhere that's even close to a place that's yeah. beautiful. That's, that's where we wrestled. And um, not that it was an eye-opener, but yeah. it, was, uh, it was the most different. And it was an eye-opener for the culture and the people. That was unbelievable. But Why? Um, the, what was them, what was it like the the people little uh, kids little kids running up to you on the street with no money and no clothes and and, and just the the mm. extreme poverty was just wild it wow. really was and uh, the, the way they live and and you know at the poorest I ever was you know I was a, a bajillionaire compared to the, how a lot of these people lived right and and there's literally I mean not nothing you can do because I guess eventually there's something you can do but individually there's really you give one kid money or food and then they all come and you can't and it's just it's hard right so you kind of have to block it out which you shouldn't have to but um, we were there to entertain and um, and it was fun <laughs> they uh, a normal wrestling match is usually a normal wrestling ring is about 18 by 18 and there's a little give to it so you can bounce a little yeah they they basically they made a 24 by 24 foot ring <laughs> with four ropes uh, that had no give. It was like a cement floor. So um, it was really an interesting uh, experience. But, uh, that, I mean, that's one of the most wild. I, I wrestled in uh, the, the top, very top of Canada, which is none of it. I wrestled in none of it. That's where the Inuits are. It's called are. none of it. It's called none of it, yeah. Okay. Um, and it's the very top, tip top. It's right next to uh, Iceland and, uh, you know, whatever, uh, Greenland, which is over there. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can't, uh, it's where the, uh, can't say Eskimos. I, I didn't know that. It's the, uh, the, uh, none of it. And the, in, the Inuits, the Inuits live up there. And, um, and that's, it was how crazy. How do you find these places? Like, <laughs> how do you find these places in the first place? I, well, I mean, that particular one, I was wrestling in Quebec. Like Quebec's someone's like, let's go wrestle at the farthest tip of Canada. Well, I mean, this, so this is how this works. And I can yeah. give you an example of how both of them work. Yeah. Uh, in India. Uh, my friend, uh, my friend is a wrestler. His name is Sanjay Dutt. He's one of my closest friends. He used to wrestle for TNA uh, Impact Wrestling. There was a guy named Jeff Jarrett who also wrestled for TNA, Impact, who actually owned, who was the owner of Impact Wrestling. Uh, someone had reached out to him saying, "Hey, we want to do this thing where we bring over some entertainment, so people from all over India will come to our trade show." Hmm. Jeff Jarrett was like, "I'll pass on that," but he, he's like, "Sanjay, would you like to head this up?" And Sanjay was like, "Yeah, of course, I'd love to." He's from Indian descent. 
He speaks the language. Uh, he's, mm. he's, he's a big star over there because he's been on television over there in India. And so he took a group of his friends. Nice. Uh, for, for the one for uh, Inuit, uh, for none of it up in uh, Canada, um, I was wrestling in Quebec at about 150 people uh, because I stand out. You know, uh, my wrestling style, it's taken me so long. I've learned the job. I stand out in the world of wrestling. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy there who lives in none of it. Uh, has a business in none of it and comes down to Quebec City because he loves wrestling, so he wants to see the local wrestling. Mm. It's like it's I probably love this. a small community. I mean, underground small community, right? Of course, of course, it's a very small community. Yeah, and so luckily, I you know my name has moved to the very top because of all just all the you know the years of training, the years of learning my job, and then the years of hustling of trying to better myself and make myself uh, in a position where people know me in this weird small community. Yeah, what's been the most hostile environment? Um, I, I wrestled, uh, on the, uh, border towns of, uh, Texas and Mexico in Mexico, uh, Montemoros, uh, Laredo, uh, there's a couple other, uh, they don't come off the top of my head. And, um, yeah, we wrestled, I remember I had gone there like a couple months before and it was packed. There's maybe six, 800 people. Huh. Then we, we went back a couple months later and there's only like, uh, maybe 150. And I asked the promoter, I said, how come? There's nobody here. He's like, oh, there was 40 people murdered at the Burger King down the street. Holy crap! That day, and you know, you hear about you know on CNN and whatever about, about the the craziness of these border towns. Yeah, and those shows were actually promoted by the cartel. Wow. So, uh, and I asked the, I asked the guy who brought me there. I was like, is that safe? And he's like, listen, you're either with the cartel or you're with the police, and uh, the police aren't going to come in and murder you, you know. <laughs> But the uh, so you're with the cartel, so you're as safe as you can get right now. <laughs> I'd be a little bit scared. <laughs> yeah, I was scared, but you know, I um, those are the life moments, you know. And we grew up in the northwest suburbs, and uh, it's stuff that doesn't happen every day where we grew up. No. And I love the idea that uh, I get to jump out of that and, and go into the real world and the real life. And I love those experiences. And if something shitty happens, it yeah. happens. Yeah. But it's not like I didn't live my life, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's hostile. I mean, like, the crowd is actually hostile towards you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm usually a good guy. I'm a goodie. Um, so for the, you know. Uh, so it's not as hostile towards you. Usually. Nobody's really hostile. You know, I, I do play a bad guy sometimes. The Gathering of the Juggalos. You know, there's there was an instance where um, I was wrestling. Not, this wasn't at the get. This was at one of their shows. Uh, in Detroit, I was wrestling. Yeah. I'm a bad guy, and I try to get them riled up. That's part of the job. I, that's right. what I love. I love doing that. And I remember they were throwing quarters and coins. And there's a there's a video on YouTube where you can see um, it's just me getting pelt. I put it up. It's like a super clip of just me getting pelt with stuff. I remember covering my opponent and being like, uh, that liquid did not feel cold. <laughs> and, uh, that's horrible. Yeah, yeah. I think we realized that it was a cup of somebody's urine. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hostile, right? All-time high moments as a wrestling Well, I think as a wrestling fan, they might have been all-time high, but I was... Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. I was... What's been the biggest crowd you've performed in front of? Um... So I was with the WWE and I wrestled in front of, you know, uh, at times 10,000, 12,000, 18,000 people. But I wasn't the star performer. You know, I was very low on, on their tier of wrestlers. Um, you know, and just this past uh, winter, I was in Japan, in Tokyo, and I was um, the semi main event. We had built up this storyline with me and my partner, Chris Hero, versus this other tag team called the Killer Elite Squad. We wrestled in front of like a sold out 3,500 uh, people. Nice. That, that was really exciting. So I've wrestled in front of big crowds yeah. where maybe they knew me but didn't, you know, I wasn't really a spotlight wrestler. Yeah. So, so this show in front of 3,500 people, which maybe wasn't the biggest, um, but was one of the biggest where all attention was kind of on me and they all knew what was going on. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. So that was probably the most exciting. So what point, Colt, did you know that? You're going for it. You're gonna. You're gonna be a professional wrestler. I mean, there's well, there's different points in my life. Um, uh, when I was like 14 or 15, I was like, I wanted to do this. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I, I feel like growing up, I didn't. I was oblivious to that. I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that was well, the case. Well, my because you were always a big football player. You went on to play college football, and that's just what I thought. I had no. I actually had no clue at the time. Well, my, my friends weren't like giant wrestling friend, fans. Yeah. 
that's including your you know your brother was yeah. you know my best friend so like they weren't giant wrestling fans so like i wasn't like going to immerse them in this world that they didn't want to take part of yeah. so it was kind of always just like my side love yeah and they you know they embraced it and like didn't make fun of me too much about my love of it but what did yes. that look like in high school junior high like what were you doing that was your your side like through your side love like I had, I had ordered these. Like I had these newsletters that told me like the inside business of mm. professional wrestling, and I would get it every week. And that those were like my bibles, and mm. I would just spend copious amount of times on AOL. You know, when it was just kind of starting. I think like, your email is still AOL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, my 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 private one is yeah. right, 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 and um, yeah, and, and finding a community out there because there wasn't one within yeah. my town. Yeah. So I used um, the internet and these newsletters uh, that would come. Who put out the newsletters? Uh, there, there's a couple of famous ones, but the two main ones when I was young was one called Pro Wrestling Torch. Yeah. It was based out of Minneapolis, and the other one was called The Wrestling Observer Weekly, and that was based out of uh, Upper California. And Dave Meltzer is a guy who was on my podcast who started The Wrestling Observer. Really? And he, he's like the guy. He's known as like the king of the inside scoops and information. Wow. And wrestling he's been doing it for over 30 how years how did he get that inside scoop was he in with like the wwf in those days yeah. or he just he it was a slow weave of like he started as a reporter and then he got in with a couple people then he got in with other people and then other people trusted him and yeah. people wanted to give him this information so it would get out there into the world yeah and he just became the guy wow became, like i can't tell you how i became popular but there i could tell you it was a slow weave of a lot of things, you know, to eventually get right. to a point to where I am now. So you were doing, you would get the newsletter, Inside Scoop newsletters, and then what did that progress to high school, college? Yeah, I, I mean, just learning about the insides of the business, what it would take to be a wrestler, what the what the lives of a wrestler yeah. were. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I went to my mother and I, you know, I said like after, you know, I said right away, can I, I want to go to a wrestling school. I want to learn how to be a wrestler. At what she point? Said, well, how old were you? I, I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. Okay, you know, and at that point, she probably they laughed at me. I think, and then yeah, when I was, she I, say? yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, <laughs> wait till you graduate college, you know. And then while I was in high school, I wanted to, and they're like, if you want to do this, you can, but you have to wait till you graduate college, and they mm. still stuck to that. And so I said, okay, I was eighteen. I graduated high school. I said, all right, I, I, I can't obviously go be a wrestler now. I have to graduate college. And uh, so I went to college and I, I, I said, I'll go to college. I'll play football because that'll look good on my wrestling resume. Hmm. And I did one year of college football and I hated it. It was one of the worst experiences really? ever. Why? It's just bad. I, I was a bad college. I was a bad. I was a great high school football ball player. I was an awful college football player. I was probably the worst player on the team. I was a redshirt freshman. I, I didn't really make friends with many of the uh, I had a different mentality. Like, I, I don't know what it was like. I, the, none of the college pl- players were really my friends. I think they. They were too into it, and I like realized, like I sucked. Like I'm, I'm not into it like I was in high school. I'm, yeah. I'm into wrestling. That's what I'm into, and yeah. no one's into that. And so um, I finished the year, and I told my parents, like I, I have to do this, and they're like, all right, you know, as long as you finish college. And so, um, I trained in between freshman and sophomore year, and then sophomore year I started wrestling, and then I wrestled as a professional wrestler all throughout my college education. So you took, was there a school, because you went to Western Michigan, was there a school there, or what were you doing to to learn? I came back to Chicago during freshman and sophomore year, and yeah, I trained uh, at at a small school that was ran by a couple 25-year-old guys who had been wrestling probably seven years at that point, and they looked the the job, they were in shape, they were tan, they were full of muscles, and um, and, and I had seen them wrestle, and they were good wrestlers, and so I was like, yeah, I'll I'll get, it was a trade school. Yeah. So I went to- What did you learn there? I learned everything. I, I, I learned- how to uh, compose yourself in a locker room. I heard how to how to treat other people who've been in wrestling. I learned how to mm. fall. I learned how to, the psychology of wrestling. I learned the basics. You know, I, yeah. I learned the basics and a great grasp of the basics, <clears throat> which would allow me to then go into the job site and then also learn on the job, which is where I did a lot of my learning, which was going to shows, traveling, wrestling other people, wrestling other people with more experience than yeah. me. But of course, you learn the, the the total fundamentals, and I learned them really well where I went because these the two trainers were great, Ace Steel and Danny Dominion. Yeah. So tell me about the psychology of wrestling because you talk a little bit. And when you interviewed Stone Cold Steve Austin, you talk. He mentions the psychology of wrestling, and a mm-hmm. few people who just I think you were talking about Ricky Steamboat, right? Who had just had like this amazing psychology, and I didn't know. I didn't really understand what what that meant. And you're not met. 
to know it. You know, yeah. you're you as a fan are meant to just come to the show and enjoy yourself. But in order to enjoy yourself, you need to be taken on a uh, on a roller coaster of emotions. Like you get that idea, right? Like yeah, I'm yeah. both wrestling and I'm being up and down. For and sure. Blue, yeah, and I mean, I used to watch sure. the Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Ultimate Warrior, all those people. So if you just sat there and watched two dudes grapple around that's just an amateur match and it can kind of get boring a little bit you know right so in pro wrestling we have psychology and that's the ability to do something to get a reaction out of the crowd mm -hmm. and you want to do it a lot and there's like a real science to it yeah, and there's yeah, a yeah. and there's a real manipulation factor to it that not you know, in a bad way, but just, yeah, in an entertaining type of way. In an entertaining way, yeah. yeah. I mean, depending how you look at it. You could look at it as in a bad way. You know, sometimes we leave people uh, upset, but in the back of their mind, they're upset so much that they want to see, they're going to come to the next show to make sure that, that their person gets comeuppance, you know. That's psychology, and that could be a bad way, but reality, it's a good way because it's about making money. It's a psychology of making money. Right, right. How are we going to twist and turn this into so we can sell more tickets? Yeah. You know, that's psychology of wrestling. Of and there's psychology to everything. There's psychology to how you put on a card for, from the first match to the seventh match. There's a psychology of just the match itself. There's a psychology of just a little integral part of the match. It's it's all. I know it's weird for big dumb wrestlers to be talking about psychology, but it's yeah. uh, that's the reality of it. So what was the um one of the best learnings advice you got from Ace when he was training you from Ace. Yeah. Oh man, I you know I that's always a weird question. I like I never. It was never like it never nothing's like rules. Just you know yeah. that's just right there. It's how just, long did he like coach you for? How long did you train with him for? That whole summer, which was which was three months, and then yeah. I would travel back ever you know probably. Once every every other week for the weekend, and so you know, probably about two years, and then became my friend and my traveling partner. Yeah, and we we wrestled and trained and, and uh, you know lifted weights, so we had a really good relationship, and we still do. So he's always been my mentor, and you know, it's just little things here and there. I you know, I I just remember I remember I I wrestled somewhere else, and I brought my match back for him to watch it. And I remember, like, the beginning was a lot of talking and not enough action. He's like, and I was so excited about it. And I just remember him being like, Colt, like, this is great, but I, I got to fast forward this. It's boring. <laughs> like, this is so boring. And I was like, oh, no. And then you, like, realize, like, okay, I might love it, but other people have to love it in order to Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a wake-up call, like, to, uh, to get into the action a little quicker or stop, stop stalling a lot when I'm wrestling. Yeah. No, I... I like to hear those little things that may have made a big impression. Maybe to him, he thought it was just normal advice, but to you, it actually you know um, made an impression on you. Um, who are your favorite wrestlers of all time? So oh, I, I, I have a lot of favorite wrestlers. You know, when I was a kid, Junkyard Dog, Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan. Like nobody really stood out as number one. It was just that whole era that rocked. Yeah, wrestling. everyone in the era. Yeah, but now, like I said, I, I, getting into it and being a part of the profession and being able to dissect it a lot, there's a, I, I really fell in love with uh, like 1960s and 70s British wrestling. And there's a lot of guys over there that I really love, uh, in particular a guy named Les Kellett, um, who I ended up doing a podcast about for my new Howl series, and a guy named Cat Weasel. And these are um, comedic pro wrestlers who don't make fun of wrestling. They make fun with wrestling, and they uh, justify it too. So it always looks like they're trying to win a bout, but they're always having fun in the match and yeah. making people laugh. And and those were like two of my biggest inspirations and yeah. my favorite wrestlers to watch. What about the, did they teach you a lot about the business of wrestling in the school or not as much? Or you just kind of left your own accord? A little, you know, in terms of like, we were like, you know, I remember one of the first things they ever said is they said, don't wrestle for free. Always make sure you get paid, you get your trans money and you get a hotel. Uh, that was implemented to me like from the very beginning. Like, yeah. Always get paid. Your trans money is whatever it took for you to get there. If it was a car, you know, your gas money and get put up in a hotel. Later to learn, like, that's not a real thing. It is a real thing. But if you're just starting out, like, a lot of people don't get that. Yeah. And, um, and, and it was kind of interesting that, like, I always had a mentality of, like, no, I get that because – or that's given to me because my trainers were like, that's what you get. And, like, maybe luckily enough for me, I fought for that in the beginning mm. when I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> so that – but that was an aspect of like that's part of the business of it. Yeah. And then a lot of a lot of people know me as like one of the most business savvy guys in wrestling. And I don't know. I, I don't think it's. I do have a business degree from uh, Western Michigan, a marketing degree. 
But I really, I, I don't think it's from that. Like, I, yeah. I think it's, maybe it's from being from a well-adjusted household. Uh, and that was part of, like, that was on people's minds yeah. was, was money and, you know, paying bills. But it was uh, learning, it was just being on the road and learning the business from other people. Yeah. And once I was on the road and I saw how other people had business transactions, that was just as interesting to me as, as the wrestling. Yeah. And I, I, I've been known as a guy, we call it the gimmick table, it's the merchandise stand. I've been known as a guy who, like, <laughs> you laugh at it. It's no, I, I love that, the <laughs> gimmick table. You know, yeah. like That's what we call it. Yeah. Um, I was known as one of the first guys who was, like, real, really, really about that and, and 10, 12, 15, 13 years ago, you never really saw people caring about that. And I was one of the only people at my table, like trying to make money, trying to get money to live. And nowadays you go to a wrestling show and that's all it is. It's the building lined with everybody and their merchandise. Right. So um, that was one, you know, from a very early yeah. beginning of me and wrestling, that was always very interesting to me. You, but it never, I don't, I don't know if it was necessarily like taught to me, Yeah. but so, some of that information was given to me. I think a lot of trainees kind of went in one ear, went out the other. But it stuck with me. I was interested in it. Do you think you got that from your dad? I, I definitely think I got it from my yeah. dad. Yeah, because um, he was an independent a clothing salesman, yeah. and he was he never was with a corporate person uh, or a corp. You and know, he's like all a, about the merchandise, right? Yeah. I mean, well, his, his money is totally based on how much he sells or or makes. That's my whole life. That's how it was. It was right. never like a, a consistent check. Yeah. And um, I, I think that came from him. I, I think the independence also came from him too. Yeah, and yeah. so, like, and so because I'm independent, I don't like asking my parents for money or anything. When I start, you know, when I got out of college, I was independent. I never asked for anything. The only way I could move up in the world was by making money. And then, you know, I, I never even thought to be like, oh, give me a bunch of money every right, month. That right. wasn't the reality. Yeah. And so. Once I, you know, I got out of college, I became a teaching assistant for two years to help support my wrestling habit, but I yeah. knew I wanted to be a wrestler. And after two years of that, I started wrestling full time, making about, you know, I, I think I had to make about $800 a month to live. And so it became more of a business because I couldn't rely on the. Yeah, the it's like this is survival. Yeah. Survival. Yeah. And I needed $800 to live, which I means I needed four shows. At a hundred dollars, and I needed to make fifty dollars in merchandise every every um, every show, or something. Maybe that was six, maybe some, six shows at a hundred, and, and each one I had to make fifty dollars. Yeah. Like, that's what I needed, and so of course, like my business was, my mind was completely business driven because so I was like, I need this money you need to eat, so yeah. I, so I can eat and survive and pay my bills because I don't want to ask them, and I don't plan on asking them. Like yeah. I'm a big, boy. this is how life works. How was that transition? Was it hard to go full time? Uh, it was hard. It, it was a little hard mentally. It, it wasn't hard like to do it because I was pretty. I was doing well in wrestling at yeah. that point. I'd been doing it for five years, and I was well established. You know, I, I was one of the the better independent guys, so I was doing pretty well. And um, but it was it was hard. Like it was just I guess to make that switch of like now you have nothing you need, to fall back on type of yeah, thing. Right. Like this is. Right, uh, Plan B is is no plan B. Yeah, that's how I say. You know, you're admitting failure. You're you're a failure when you when you say I I'll have this Plan B so I can suck at this one thing and then jump into the other. What's some of the best selling merchandise? Like then, what was some of the best selling merchandise then and then now? Well, the wrestling T-shirt has always been a staple. As Which one? Over here. Uh, well, there's the I start of them. Yeah, I mean, I have a whole bunch here, and then there's a bunch on the internet that aren't even in stock right here <laughs> at uh, ColtMerch.com. You have a best-selling... Uh, best yeah, I Star Colt is probably the best one. Uh, it's a Jewish star. It says, I love Colt. Uh, you know, CM the Punk wore it. CM Punk wore it, yeah. He wore it on Raw, and it kind of spiked a lot of the, uh, out of the sales. <laughs> what made you think to make that shirt? I think I was looking for... Uh, you know, I've always embraced uh, not Judaism, the religion, but Judaism, the culture. I, I love yeah. being a part, you know, a, as a Jewish wrestler. I think it's fun. I think the culture is funny. Um, kind of you look at like Seinfeld, Sarah Silverman ish type style, you know, right. like I think that's funny, you know. Right. Um, and I'm a funny wrestler. And so I think I was looking just for shirts and I saw on a um, like a funny shirt site. It just said, I star Jews, I think. And I was like, oh, that's funny. And uh, no one really wrestling had like an I love New York type shirt. You know, I heart New York, I star, whatever. 
And so that's that's the inspiration for that T-shirt. It takes some creativity. I mean, I had no idea one of your moves was the Billy Goats curse. Yeah. Is that a good selling shirt? The Billy Goat curse shirt or no? It, it's just one of the shirts that I have up. Like, I, yeah. to be to be fair, yeah. I don't really keep an inventory of what I do and don't sell. I probably should. Uh, I'm at the, just the point of like if I if I put it out and I take them to shows because I do about 150 200 shows a year so like what I see moving is just like oh, I'll order more of those and I'll right. keep that one and this one isn't moving so I'll kind of push it aside and um, and the yeah I have a shirt called the Billy Goats Curse that's my finishing move it's based off the Chicago Cubs and it's kind of like it's got this guy it's a reverse Boston crab so I was like oh I like I, I like the idea of having an animal because the Boston crab uh, the crab. Um, you know, is what the move is called. So this is the reverse of it. So like a Billy Goat's Curse kind right, of right. flip. So that's yeah, that's one of my shirts, and uh, it's it's a name of my move. But yeah, that's kind of how my merch works uh, in terms of t-shirts. And um, got I, you know, I have my merch. Can you see my merch bag is right there? Yeah, so yeah. That, that that's I just came home and I put that on the floor. That's what I'll take. It's a big duffel bag every weekend. You know, if I do two or three shows. And, uh, you know, I put, I put in a, a stack of the t-shirts. I have DVDs that I sell. I have, yeah. um, oh, hold up. You know, I just got these from uh, Mexico. These are little keychains that I have. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, over here is a stack of pictures that I have, different pictures that I so sell. So do people, do you stay after and sign autographs? How does that work? I'm before, I'm before the show. I'm at intermission and I'm, a, I'm after, of course, yeah. any opportunity to make a, not to make you know to make a sale like make a fan make a sale yeah right yeah like I like being there I like talking to the fans I like also you know if I'm able to sell something if they want something and now I'm at the point where I'm doing pretty well where like you know 10, 15, 10, 15 years ago it was a hustle it was trying to like move the merchandise to them and now it's more of like I'm doing fine if you want yeah. the merchandise great if you don't let's talk a little bit you right, know right it's a, it's a completely different spectrum which i'm glad that i don't have to like hound somebody to buy a picture so i can eat that day right. that's how it used to be. that's yeah. how it used to be. yeah and now now it's um you know i put out so much free content into the world to try to make a fan if you're a fan and you want to support me great if you want something to be like i love this guy's uh podcast or i love his youtube show or, i love how he wrestles Great. If you don't, let's talk. You know, if you can't afford it, let's talk. Because I've been there, and before, you know, I, I would have been like, no, I need, I need to sell something. But now it's like, oh, I get being broke. I get wanting to just meet somebody and not have to buy something, and I'm happy to do that. Right. So tell me about the Wrestling Road Diaries. When did you, when did you do the first one? Oh, this is the first one, and uh, this yeah. is the DVD, and uh, we put it out. Uh, we filmed it in 2009. It got put out in 2011, and. Um, in 2009, there wasn't. This is kind of before the podcasting boom really hit. I yeah. think you know, 2009, uh, 2010, it started. I, I think it kind of started boom. Maybe a little. Maybe 2009 ish. But uh, um, no one really knew about the in, uh, the the inside of the inside really re of the wrestling of the independent road hadn't been documented. There was Beyond the Mat, which was basically about WWF, and they had a little bit of independence. But there wasn't a lot of like, how do these independent wrestlers do what they're doing, and it not look in a negative light, in a positive light, because it is a positive. But the media always seems to want to just like show the the horrible aspects. Like of what? It, right? What what comes out that's negative? Oh, everything. I mean, just the way the media like of the lifestyle, especially independent. Like these guys are hardcore wrestling was a big thing for a while. You know, these guys are hitting themselves for twenty bucks, and they're killing themselves, and they're going to their job. You know, they, they it's have like to how UFC is now, probably. <laughs> You know, like the independent for the, UFC for the younger, yeah, probably, yeah. 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 So we, well, I wanted a positive spin on how my life was, and so uh, we filmed it in 2009. I had this guy edited it for me in Philadelphia, a guy I'd been working with. Uh, and the time we filmed it was with Daniel Bryan. By the time we filmed it, he had then signed with WWE, and then when we put it out, he was like one of the number oh, one wow. WWE. So that was like what helped uh, you know the, the DVD move a lot originally. How do you get it out but, there? So you come out with it, you edit it, you spend a ton of time filming it, editing, getting out there. How I didn't you... I didn't film and edit, but I did we 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 I had brought a camera guy with me. Right, I, I know, I, I know you right, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Right. How do I market this? Yeah, yeah. How do I market this? And that's why the podcast for many reasons the podcast has started, but one of the original reasons was the podcast uh, of many, but one of the main ones was uh, other people had these radio shows 
And I knew I'd have to do all these different radio shows, which I hated doing because I, 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 I didn't like sitting on my I didn't like sitting on my uh, phone, talking to people, hearing like four or five people in the background, uh, like spilling my guts and then them not even caring. And like I'm, it got very tedious and very annoying. And I was like, but I'm going to have to do this. And I'm like, well, why don't I just have a? Th- if I had a thing, yeah, yeah, I would, I would be able to just do go on my own commercial every single week, right. and sell and sell this thing, yeah. And so essentially, it start. So it was there for you know the podcast was to help this commercial of my movie that I wanted to sell, and that was kind of the initial marketing move on my behalf. Was that the first one, the Wrestlers Road Diaries? The first wrestling road, the first diaries, road, yeah. So which came out. 2011 but we had filmed it in 2009 and i started my podcast in 2010 knowing that it was going to eventually come out Mm, okay wow yeah so you started the podcast during a big turning point for you Mm -hmm. so what tell you know tell people what was going on at the time when you decided to start your podcast well well I, i was fired by the wwe um I didn't feel I had an outlet. So like, I didn't have an outlet to, I I felt I had a sympathetic story. I felt I had a good story. I felt I was an entertainer. I felt I was a good talker. I felt people liked me, but nobody wanted to give me an outlet for people to like me. And that was the biggest thing. And, uh, WWE had fired me. I went back to this company called ring of honor. Then they had fired me. Uh, this, the, the second biggest company that on the time was, it was on spike TV called TNA. They brought me in for a tryout and then they didn't want me. And so basically nobody wanted me and it was either, well, I quit wrestling because nobody wants me or, you know, I find an outlet that I, that I can find my own fans. Right. And it, cause I was basing it on like wrestling promotions that needed me, you know, re- wrestling promotions had to hire me to put me in something and podcasting. Cause I was a huge fan of podcasting. I was listening to all these. Yeah. What were you podcasts. listening to at the time? Comedy, bang, bang, Doug loves movies. Um, uh, Never Not Funny. Um, I'm trying to think the one. Mark WTF, The Nerdist. So it was a lot of – it was basically – and then I think This American Life was the only non-comedy podcast at the time. Now I'm in – I have a wider range, but it's mainly right, comedy right. And kind of uh, post-produced podcasts. Because not many people at the time are even listening to podcasts. Right. So a fan of mine heard me on a radio show say I liked comedy, and they were like, oh, you like comedy? You should listen to this podcast, which was Comedy Death Ray at the time. It's like it's all your favorite comedians for free, and I was like, "Free, great! I have no money. I can't afford anything." Right, right. And they, these guys have a show for free, and he's like, "Yeah, you got to go on iTunes, and then you got to look on iTunes under podcasts because you know it's like I had to like right. Duck, dive it's not that easy. Money. Yeah, it wasn't easy. And eventually, I did find it, and then I was like, "Oh my god, I love this!" And then that took me to someone else's, and then that took me to someone else's, and then right at the time, nobody was really into it, and Marin's was the big one, and like I've been documented in like. You know, there's an article in the Chicago Reader and the Rolling Stone is just like what a great influence he was. And yeah, yeah. Even you first... talk about it on you when you were on his podcast, you talk about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, oh, like I love I can see what he's doing. It correlates to wrestlers and wrestling. He might not think it or even know it, but I know it does. And I was like, I can't wait for the wrestling one to come out so I can listen to that one. And then, I was, and then no one did. And I was like, oh. I guess I'll just put out the wrestling one, <laughs> and that's kind of how it how it all came to be. And that goes another thing with the inside look at you know the wrestling road diaries was an inside look at our independent life, and then the podcast came out, and it's like oh this is this is a real in depth look right. at, at what wrestlers are like uh, because essentially it's a locker room chat you know that's recorded. Yeah, and, and those chats are sometimes weird or, or different, or but or we talk about you know it just it goes on a variety of different yeah, places wherever it goes wherever it goes and um and yeah and so since then you know a lot now steve austin has one jericho jim ross all these millionaires and famous people have these podcasts and you and you get a, an inside look but like at the time where the movie and my podcast started that really wasn't a thing that, that was happening yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting you mentioned those people so you know there is a youtube video of of chris jericho mentioning you on it and so then i click over and i go to his podcast but he doesn't he doesn't interview wrestlers he interviews comedians so it's completely different he, inter- he interviews a hodgepodge of, of yeah people. yeah but i th- i think it's like he he thinks uh he's this wide scope of which he is but the reality like 
I know the wrestling fans. They just want to listen to wrestlers, you know. Right. But I think he wants to have these other guys on. I don't know him. I don't know him that well, so I don't know his world. Yeah. That's what I think he's. Uh, he's because you. So what did the f- the first podcast you put out? Yeah. Tell me about those first. Are you just on the road? What What does that look like? Well, I knew I wanted to do it. I had looked into the equipment that I had to buy, yeah. and, and um, yeah, uh, to this day, you know, I, I have one of the craziest schedules in independent wrestling, and just maybe one of the craziest schedules ever amongst people. <laughs> you know, uh, I did one hundred seventy-five thousand miles last year. That's United crazy. Yeah. Yes, I'm all over the place. I'm always in a different locker room around different people. And so I was like, I have access to all these people yeah. in person, which yeah, I yeah. like. I, yeah. I don't want to do it, you know, no offense, over Skype or, or over uh, over telephone or whatever. I love yeah. the idea of looking someone face in the to eye. Face to face. Yeah, having that conversation. And um, so that was, I knew I had access to it, and so I needed the equipment. And then the first one, you know, I had asked my friend. His name was Sean Davari. He was in WWE for many years. He had a great story of, you know, moving, you know, himself away from his family yeah. to – to become, you know, and his his family was rich, and he made himself poor, and it was just this great story, and and how he worked, moved his way up, a, a little skinny, you know, Arab kid who worked his way up, uh, you know, and became this big star in professional wrestling, and so he was a, he is a great friend, it was a great friend, and I was like, I'd like to try this thing out if we record it and it sucks, we will, you know, I'll never use it, but if it's good, you know, I'll pay. he's like, yeah, whatever you want, and that's it's all based on my friends, like, yeah, yeah. so it's like I don't feel bad. He's like, otherwise we would we were just sitting in a hotel otherwise, so it's like. <laughs> Yeah, let's record this, and we'll see uh, if it's good. So and what I, equipment were you using at the time? you remember? Uh, so I had, um, I had an iPod, and then I had a machine. It kind of So I use a Zoom now, a Zoom 6. Uh, a Zoom 6. I just switched over from a Zoom uh, H4n. But I had an iPod that I stuck into a machine that, that would then have the mics that you could record into the iPod. And then mm. I would take a voice memo. Because I remember that was easy to – if I had Wi-Fi, I could send that voice memo to the guy at the time who was editing my, my shows together. And so I thought that was the easiest was I'd have it there and I could just send it via the thing uh, to another person. Yeah. And then it's moved throughout the years. Um, and then uh, I realized that like I shouldn't be having somebody else edit it because I don't have full control over it. Yeah. So then I taught myself how to do GarageBand. Um, and then I, I took the, you know, I take the iPod and I would put it in the garage band and then I realized it was too unsafe because the iPod could disconnect from the thing and I didn't like that. And then, uh, my friend at the time, Marty DeRosa, he had a podcast, he has a podcast called wrestling with depression yeah. and he was like, he used the zoom. A lot of people are using it. So I switched over to the zoom. Um, and then from the zoom, you know, for years I used that zoom H4 on this, is the same one that I use. So the zoom just, plugs into what when you record it? Like, so computer? I have a zoom H4. Nope. I just record on the Zoom. I oh. have two. I have two uh, Shure mics that I use. Uh, you know the same ones that stand-ups use SM58s. I think SM58Bs they're called. And um, those two mics uh, with some XLR cables. And then afterwards, I'll take the uh, the SD disc. I'll put it into my computer. I'll drive and I'll drag that to GarageBand, and then I'll edit it from there. And now I've just changed to the Zoom Six. Uh, and then when I'm so I, there's two. There's the interviews on the road. That's what I'll take on the road. Yeah. And then when I'm in person, when I'm here and I do my befores and afters and my ad roll and my ad reads and just other stuff. The, you know the Howl series that I have. Yeah. I use uh, an SM77, I think, which is the big old fat Shure mic. Uh, and then I'll connect that to my um, to my to my Zoom and I'll record on the big guy. And then you put the disc right in the computer and then edit in GarageBand. Yeah. So what kind of stuff – so now you have your guests on the road and you always do it face-to-face or do you ever do it via – always face-to-face? Always face-to-face. Always face-to-face. And, and then you then put it into GarageBand. You're now editing it. So what kind of stuff do you edit? Uh, well, I mean the uh, the interview is, is very much um, evergreen and I don't really touch the interview. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I'll take something out when somebody um, maybe says something – that could either get me in trouble or even I, I've protected people before. Uh, I had a guy in the WWE uh, at the time that I interviewed and he said kind of a racial, a racial slur and I don't think he knew about it. And uh, maybe it's, I don't know if it's not right. You for didn't want to just uh, risk it for him type of thing. Yeah. I don't want to have him get in trouble and yeah. uh, cause, cause he's my friend. And so, 
I think that's the difference between me and maybe a lot of different podcasters uh, is that like I'm not looking for the big thing. I'm just looking to have real genuine conversation. Yeah. And I didn't want that to yeah. get in the way. But uh, usually there's not much editing that goes on. It's just Well, then there is. Then, oh, then I, I have a front part and I have a back part, you know. And then I also have ad, re- ad reads and I score some music into it and I score some music in and out. And um, I'll, I'll do a monologue and sometimes I'll do – uh, I'll find myself doing like a 20 minute monologue and then I'll ch- kind of chop it up so uh, it doesn't go that long. And so I find myself editing for about an hour each week. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I mean, it's not, not a huge amount of editing, but there is, there's more. It's not just record it and throw it up. There. Yeah. No, that's what I'm wondering because some people are like, should I edit it? Should I not edit it? And obviously you have a certain editing process. Should I do it myself? Should I not do it myself? What What are your thoughts on that? I think doing that? it. Yeah. Do, well, that's what I learned. Like, there was just like this little like like listen like you, you I only want to put out stuff that I love you know like that's been since day one because I love wrestling documentaries I you know I I love wrestling I love podcasts I love comedy mo- comedy you know and so like that's why I, I do these comedy shows and that's why I wrestle comedic style I, I I put out there what I would like as a fan so if you're giving it to someone else and they're editing it and that that editor has a different vision. And you're like, no, that's not the vision. But you're like, I don't know what to do about it. You need to learn to do it so it's your vision. Right, right, right. Uh, that's my thoughts, you yeah. know. And so, you know, so at the end of the day, the end product is exactly what you want. Yeah. Uh, and if there's hiccups in the way, then you have to go about and find the right ways so you can do it, so you can get rid of those hiccups. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of editing, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, I, so I mean, this YouTube's the greatest. Like, you know, I had a. a I had a friend who taught me how to do a little bit of Photoshop, a little bit of iMovie years ago. Yeah, and yeah. so from there, I had a basis of it. And then from there, I just YouTube, YouTube, tutorial, tutorial, learn this, learn that. You know, you'll, you learn so much stuff from an eight-year-old boy on YouTube. How to, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. I'm going to have to edit that out because I'm just going to edit like so it's an eight-year-old boy. No. You learn so much stuff from an eight-year-old Yeah. <laughs> but it's true, man. Those kids are geniuses. It is. You know, so – the process is so once you have that that final file right after you've edited it you put on your if there's ads on there and whatever your music now you have this final file what do you do with yep. it yeah i have it so i have an mp3 um uh well i i use this thing called the levelator i don't know if uh, people know what that is no what, so, what so you use garage is that on garage band or what is it no that's just an independent thing i oh. think it's almost you can find it out there so essentially um if me and my guests aren't talking at the same levels, mm. uh, I'll, I'll put this file in the level later, oh. and uh, and I'll make it so it's all the same level. So that's great, yeah. Because that's one of the worst things is when you're listening to a podcast and one guy's talking loud, and then the other guy's talking soft. So then you have to jack up the volume, and then the next guy talks is like, ah, jack the volume down. Right, right. So that's a lesson I learned. You know, that's that was part of uh, the learning process is make sure that it's all one good level, and that's what the level later did. Yeah. And so before I throw it into GarageBand, I'll throw the file into the level later, and then I'll throw it into GarageBand, mm-hmm. and then uh, import to MP3 uh, in my iTunes, and then uh, I have my file, and then uh, I, uh, I I wait every single Wednesday night at midnight for the most part um, in Chicago time, and when it's ready, I'll uh, SoundCloud is my host, and yeah. through uh, because through Earwolf because I'm with Midroll, they they hooked me up with like a you know a SoundCloud Plus account. And uh, take it into the upload. It uploads on SoundCloud. I put in my title. I put in my description. I put in my tags, and uh, and I put the button. <laughs> when I push the button, yeah. it goes out to the world. Yeah, they have the RSS feed. So, what about and you put it on YouTube too, though, right? So yeah. So my process. If you you want to know my process. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this is my process. Wednesday night is uh, I put it up. I uploaded it. Then I have ColtCabana.com. And so I have it on there where I can embed the um, the SoundCloud app. So when you go to coldcommander.com, the first thing on the page you see is my podcast. Yeah. And you can click and listen. And then below it, I have yeah. – uh, or, or I think underneath it, I have the, the last five. And so uh, right away, I'll put – you know, I'll go to uh, – I had a guy make me a website so I could kind of do it. Again, same yeah. thing. is like I can't build a website, but hey, can you build me this website so then I can then take over the right. steps. Right, I right, can do right. it myself. Yeah. And uh, – and so then I, I embed the video, and then I also put the picture of me and the guest, and then I put that link too, so then you can click on those. Uh, and then I'll also um, – iMovie, I'll take it to iMovie. I'll take the picture of me and my guest. I'll put that as the image, 
I'll drag the clip of the MP3 underneath it. And so I'll make the image an hour long. I'll make the clip an hour long. Yeah. And then I'll, up, I'll upload that to YouTube. And, um, and then I'll usually, and then I wake up Thursday morning and that's when I'll start pushing it on Twitter. I'll push it on Twitter, Instagram, Vine, and Facebook. Yeah. And that's when I'll, I'll make the, I make the YouTube link available Thursday morning as opposed to Wednesday night at midnight. I don't, why I do that, I don't know. I feel I, I don't I don't want people to get in the habit of only listening to it on YouTube. Yeah. I want I want YouTube kind of to be where people like find it by mistake maybe and it's easy to click and listen to and then they become sc- subscribers on the on their feed, you know, uh through the way it should be. I I feel it should be listened to through the podcast app or iTunes. Yeah. And so that's usually my process every Wednesday night slash Thursday morning. So do you, and I, you always do it live or do you have something that will do future episodes? Because you probably have a bunch in the bank, right? Or do you do you have a bunch yeah, so that you've I'll, already done? Yeah, I'll bank I'll bank a bunch of episodes, anywhere from like three to eight episodes usually. And it's very important that I tell my guests like, hey, I've got a lot in the bank, please, you know, because I know what it's like to do something and then it doesn't come out for a while and you're like, when's this going to come out? I'm, I'm giddy about it. So I let them right. know. Like I got a while, it won't come out for a while, and when it does, you know, I'll put you on Twitter and I'll I'll feed you into all of that, and you'll see it'll come out. And so uh, I do, yeah. And then so I have those in the bank, and then um, every you know Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, I'll record those front bumpers. So I because the front bumpers is what's happening in my life, and I want to put that out there. I want to tell my story because yeah. every, every week I have something crazy happening or yeah. something to plug, you know, that yeah. too, or something happening going on and. And so that's another business model of a commercial. But, I, you know, I don't push it so much as a commercial. I, I try to tell it in a story uh, or tell a story or a monologue. And I inter, intermingle the stuff that I'm trying to push from a business sense. And then I'll do that that the week of. And then right. I'll mix it together. Yeah. So you save that the week of. So then the next morning you'll put it on all the social media um, and everything like that for that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it is, but it's um, you know, it's it, the reality is is like if I wasn't doing it, which I could not be doing it, I'd just be sitting around doing nothing. And like I, I have don't days think so. I, I mean like that's my business, you know, like I, I mean yeah, you're I could, so busy, right? Like let's say you go to Ireland, right? You're yeah. you're going to Ireland soon, right? Yeah. yeah. And you're in Ireland. So Sometimes you may get back, I don't know, on a Monday night or Tuesday, like, oh, my God, Wednesday, you have to do all this editing and Thursday. I don't know. But, How have yeah. you not missed a week? Well, it's great because I, it's all portable. I have my portable podcast equipment with me. I have my, I have my laptop with me. Yeah. So when I'm in Ireland and I know I'm going to get home Tuesday night and I'm going to have all this jet lag and I'm not going to want to do it Wednesday, yeah. I'll sit in the hotel and I'll do the recording in the hotel. And I have the good, the nice equipment, the nice mics. I could do it there. And then I know I have this long ire, this flight from Ireland. And I'll know, oh, okay, I'll just edit it while I'm on the flight. Mm. You know, it's all accessible. So I'm, I, you know, I'm not reliant on a studio yeah. or anything. And that's that's why I'm able to do it. Yeah. Because no matter where I go, I bring, I can bring my equipment with me. It's very portable. Yeah. You mentioned some of the platforms. I want to talk about. You mentioned the the Zoom device, the um, the Shure mics, the Levelator. You use SoundCloud, and the reason SoundCloud is because of midroll. You said. Mm-hmm. Um, what other softwares or you said GarageBand, iMovie? What other softwares or things you find helpful with the the production? piece or just throughout the process of producing the podcast anything else that you you use yeah i think i hit it all i don't know i like i I do you know photoshop's another thing i enjoy doing and that has nothing to do but like you know uh you can always make stuff and you can always uh you you know pictures or whatever to post up somewhere um so you know i have an app uh when i uh with instagram and stuff and I, i have an app on my phone that i'll use to like put the text over the picture of the episode and where to find it yeah. so whenever you follow me you can see that that's an app that i use like it's that's something that i know that's in my my weekly uh, habitual but in terms of software and stuff that's uh nice. i think that's yeah i think yeah. i hit them all on the, on the head what do you do as far as the because you have a bunch of sponsors right so mm-hmm. is there a certain way you record them a certain time limit or that you you know record pre or post or in the middle well, I mean, they're sold as pre-rolls, they're sold as mid-rolls, and they're sold as post-rolls. Right. And I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about any of it, but I assume, like, 
Uh, the I way didn't the know for roll- certain points where you put it, whatever you can or can't talk about is fine. Oh, okay. like you put it like oh at this like halfway through and it has to be for like two well, minutes long or what? How does that? Well, work? the min rolls are supposed to be a minute long, and and I think the the the, the pre rolls are supposed to be fifteen minute fifteen seconds. Or now they've moved to kind of like thirty, anywhere fifteen to thirty seconds. So, but I never want to chop up my inner my uh, my conversation. Right. And that's Stolten, Mark Marin d- did that, and, and the Nerdist does that, and Pete Holmes does that, and like these are guys that I like their shows, and yeah. I like how that's done. So I like, so I'm you know the same way. Like, oh well, I don't I like that, so I don't want to do that. So that's kind of why I have the sections of the beginning, the monologue, and then in between the monologue and the long conversation, that's where I'll put my mid rolls. And also, it's very like, it's formulaic. It's formulaic, and so that's where the fans know. And so, like, if they want to skip over it, they skip over it. Yeah, like, they I, know I where it is. Can't force anybody to listen to anything. And also, uh, like, I have a song of the week, and I play an independent song every week about you know ab- about wrestling. And so, like, if they want to listen to that, they know that's what's going to sponsor the song of the week. And then on the, after the song, sometimes there's an if I saw if I have another mid roll, I put I'll put that after that. And so usually they're a minute, and um, at first I found myself trying to stick to a minute on the dot because I was like, that's what they're paying for, that's what they get. But then, uh, like, uh, you know, the last couple of years, I've if it goes a minute 15, a minute 30, whatever, like, uh, you know, because sometimes I'll go on a tangent, and I'm like, well, that's kind of part of the show, and that's right. why they're advertising with podcasts. Because you're because, a personality, and you're going to put your personality into it. Yeah, yeah, and, and so, um, and then they'll be happier with me. Because they get a little longer time with me, and I should want be wanting to make these guys happy. Because you know, in a way, these guys have changed my life by allowing by paying me to podcast, which is crazy. Because I did this for free for years. Yeah. And How many I'll, years were you doing it for free before you actually got paid? Maybe two and a half or three. I can't remember yeah. the exact date. Yeah, I think 2013 they came. Uh, they came a knocking, and uh, the only way they came a knocking is uh, my friend Marty DeRosa opened for the Sklar Brothers, who are a, com- a comedy duo. Uh, they've done Madison a lot, and um, I went and did their podcast because they do kind of a sports slash comedy podcast, and they were with Earwolf, and I'm a wrestler, so they're like, "Oh, let's have this wrestler on," and I'm a big fan of theirs, so it kind of just worked. Yeah. And then all, and then the next day, like I tweeted my my fans, and then all of a sudden they got all this traction, and everybody at Earwolf were like, "Who the hell is this guy? How did?" And they said they've never had more like social interaction than they've had yeah. with me on his guests. Nobody even knew who I was outside of the Star Brothers. Probably barely knew who I was. And so then the next time I came in, I think I went in to do their show again, maybe a couple months later or a half a year later, and uh, Jeff Ehrlich, who, who was running, who started Earwolf with Scott Ackerman, uh, he was there and he was like, hey, w- would you care about putting, do you have ads? And at that time I had a couple of ads of my friends, you know, 50 bucks here, you know, or 75 bucks there. And I was like, yeah, I have ads. And he's like, we have this company. We're just starting. Like I was one of the first guys with minerals, and then he told me like the number you can make with the CPMs, and I was like, whoa! Like I thought the fifty dollars from you know from one of the companies was good. I didn't realize that like you know um, you can make real money with uh, with podcasting. So, what point do you think you had some traction as far as downloads went? I mean, the good thing is, is that like I never, I didn't go into it like thinking about downloads. Yeah. You know? No, I like, know that's that's what yeah. makes it work, and you do that's you know, that's part of it, right? You don't do you're not you didn't start off doing it because of this reason, but because of your passion and what you do, you do it for two and a half, three years, not expecting, not really expecting anything, right? right? I mean, well, just did get traction knowing. on your video. I mean, you want to promote the Wrestling Road Diaries and some of your merchandise and things like that, but and I want people to know me better. Because yeah. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm lovable, you know. So yeah. the, that's the only way to do it. And then because I'm doing it, like I'm having such a blast talking to my friends, getting, you know. And then they'll be like, "Oh, I got all these tweets from these fans." I'll be like, and that made my heart like happy. Yeah. That these, that you know, I had some friends that like, they they don't know much about social media, and then they've never really put themselves out there. And then all of a sudden, when I give them this platform, and then all of a sudden they make all these new fans, and like that means the world to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love that, cause, especially because they're my friends. So. Uh, that's why I was, you know, that's I why do have I do the highlight because some people who also, you know, we talk about podcasting, it's become more and more popular and more people are having podcasts and it's almost, I think sometimes seen as something easy. Oh yeah. You just put up a podcast and you get all these downloads and you, you know, make money off of it. And the truth is, you know, you're doing it for, for years before doing anything. So that's, I was wondering well, when people, yeah. Go well, ahead. also you have to know that I was in 
the wrestling world is this bubble, like it's a small little community bubble. And I was pretty big in the wrestling world. Yeah. And I, cause I'd been doing it for at that point, 11, 12 years and also at a higher level, you know, I've traveled all over the world. So yeah. when it, when people are, when I'm able to say, I've got a new podcast, people will know about it You're in the, the wrestling world. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes uh, a headline, if you will, you yeah. know? And so people are clicking on it to see what, what this is, as opposed to someone who hasn't put in the time at a thing that they're good at or whatever. And that's why like you have, to, I always tell the people like you have to become, you have to become an, like almost an expert at something that you want to podcast, that you want to pack that you want to podcast about. We're in Chicago. <laughs> I said that real Chicago. Dude. <laughs> and then you also have to have a real strong point of view, I think. And like, so that people want to either like get behind it, believe in it or, um, or, or, or even opposed to it, but it has to be like a point of view and something that you believe in it. But you also have to be really, really good at something that you're talking about. Uh, you know, otherwise, I don't think people will Gravitate mingle around it. Yeah, or yeah. Grab it. Yeah. Great yeah. word. Yeah. So those people approach you and say, "You can, you can make these CPMs or whatever it is." Mm-hmm. So at that point, do they say, "Come on board," or what? What happens? Would you be interested? And I no. was like, "Uh, yes." <laughs> 100 percent and then they were like here this is how it works what's your banking what's your check number so we can direct deposit and here would you talk about this? would you talk about they're like you can nix anybody you want you know like here's the groups that want to advertise with you if you don't want to you don't have to yeah. and i was you know i was like uh, you know hulu plus of course this is why would i like i love hulu plus i love television why would i not want to harry's razor blades of course bomba socks amazing i'm wearing Bomba sucks right now. <laughs> so do they just approach, they put you up on the platform. At that point, the advertisers can choose, yes, we want to advertise on the art of wrestling. Yeah. Or they can be like, you might want, you might want to be with these guys. They have a demographic of 18 to 34 and they have X amount of listens. And uh, here we took a survey and, you know, it said 92% of people will buy something from Colt because they like Colt and they believe in what he's talking about. Yeah. So, so who that, else? And you that company is like, oh, okay, yeah. You have the socks. Who else? Bombas, Harry's, uh, Five Four Club has jumped on board. And What's like, Five Four Club? Oh, they, yeah. I just listened to your podcast. Yeah, it's like uh, someone clothing. said you were stylish or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like I talked. They really to work them. if that's the case. Yeah, I I, I talked to him. like I talked to Five Four on the phone and like they were like. He's like, I'm a wrestling fan. I like what you do. And so like, awesome. we, we built this. We built this uh, and I, that's what I like. Yeah. And they were like, we can't believe it. Not a lot of people will take the time. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you're directly allowing me to do what I want to do. Right, like, right. I have all the time in the world for you, my right, sponsor. Right. And it's crazy. I, I think a lot of these people aren't directly talking with their sponsors, which is wild to me. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I want to have a, a relationship with them. Yeah. I want them to like me. Right. So when, when it's up for renewal... They're, I, they're like, yeah, Colt's, Colt's great. He, what a great guy he was. Even if his numbers aren't coming in, we like the human being, Colt. We will still pay him <laughs> to put uh, you know, our advertising. It's about up. relationships, yeah. So who oh. else? So um, Harry's and then who else? Uh, Squarespace, which they kind of do everybody. Um, uh, you know, I have an, indiv- an, an independent one. It's called, uh, well, Pro Wrestling Tees is the big one, which is a company that I helped start. So, oh, really? uh, yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, you know, so I'm always plugging them. Um, uh, high spots has been with me since the second episode. I plug them, but that's, they're not through the mid roll. So I have some independence and I have some of my own. So pro wrestling tees, is that the, what's the website? Yeah. Well, one hour tees is the billboards that I'm on. Yes. Right. And pro wrestling tees.com T E E S. Yeah. And uh, I made this. So one hour tees was an early independent sponsor. Uh, I had a relationship with them. They're How did Chicago. they hear about you? Uh, my friend needed a shirt for television, and he needed it quick. Uh, I knew these guys through the Kosher Ham Company, which was uh, a, a guy out of High- Highland Park who knew a bunch of my friends, who knew his friends. Right. Ju- Jewish geography, right? Yeah. And so he had this T-shirt place. We needed a T-shirt for television. Like Within a day, he was like, yeah, I'll do it for free. I was like, hey, would you want to sponsor my podcast? Maybe give me – and at that point, it wasn't monetarily. Hey, if you give me 60 free T-shirts, I'll give you a week's plug. And then I took those 60 free shirts and I sold them for $20 each. 
each, and then I made twelve hundred. Yeah. yeah, twenty. Double I double. did. I didn't twenty. Sixty times. t-shirts at twenty oh, bucks. Oh yes, yes, yes. Twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I look at it a lot like that way, and a lot. Of, I recommend a lot of people also start bartering. You know. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I look at it like I could, this company, you know, maybe it's it costs low to give me something. Right. 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 I, and return it for That's something smart. higher, yeah. and I make my money's worth. I do. I do a lot of that. I really, and I did that with with button companies because then I'd sell merchandise. I'd sell buttons, stickers, eight by tens, printing places. Uh, a lot of my marketing, a lot of my sponsorship was trading that, uh, and then being able to sell turning that stuff. into dollars. Yeah, turning yeah. into money. Yeah, and um, so uh, Ryan, who owns One Hour Tees, is a big wrestling fan. I was getting all my stuff there. I was sending all my wrestlers to get T shirts there. Uh, I was giving him a lot of business. And yeah. then, uh, and then he was like, "Let's do this thing where we start on demand. You know, we can on demand a shirt. We just put up a page. Everyone gets a page. You put up your graphics, and then when an order comes in, we make it. We ship it out." And he's like, "I I don't know anyone in wrestling. You're the one who knows people in wrestling." I was like, "Yep." And then I collected all my wrestling fans, friends. We put it together. The business grew, and now we just sent over two million dollars in royalties to professional wrestlers. That's crazy! Uh, wow. Less than, yeah, in less than three years, and it's for me. Like it's nice. I make a nice little like a little check. Ryan's business is doing great. We moved. In, he's moved into three different places over the years. Wow. But the most important thing is, is that these wrestlers are getting paid. And they're getting paid fairly, and they're mm-hmm. able to subsidize their wrestling. They're able to make money, and this way, it's not as hard for them to struggle. Some of them now don't need day jobs because the the t shirt money is helping them yeah. live the life it's as a an huge artist. Huge difference. Yeah. 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 And that's for me, like these are the, the brothers that I've been in wrestling with for 17, 18 years. Yeah. And it's all about like helping these guys live a dream, make money and be able to do this kind of full time if they want to. Yeah. So can fans go directly to pro wrestling dot com and get their yeah. own shirts or yeah, they well, they can get the shirts of their favorite wrestlers. Yeah. They know that that like, you know, it, the money goes right to those guys. That's yeah. awesome. And then if you want to go to one-hour tees, you can get any T-shirt you want because they make custom T-shirts in less than an hour. Right. <laughs> so how did the billboard come about? Uh, he was uh, Ryan. That's a whole other thing. And you, I don't know. Ryan, he's one of these guys, and I'm not this way. He knows you got to spend to make. I'm always kind of like, ah, what's the most I could do to not spend to make? You right, know? Yeah. He's spend to make, and he was putting billboards all over the city. And then once I jumped on, he's like, would you have any – Would can I just put you on a billboard? I was like, yes. Yes, you can. And not only that, you could put me on 30 of them and you could do it for the last five years if you want. And so that he was just like, he thought like maybe it'd be fun to have like a person on there. I think he was putting his wife's picture up there for years as, as an Asian girl on these billboards. And it was a little more fun, I think, to have local Chicago celebrity Colt Cabana on there. And so that's kind of how those billboards. And then I think I was in the, the movie theater. He did ads in the movie theaters. And I, uh, you know, I read, because uh, I have the podcast equipment, so I sent him an audio clip. And I read, hey, you know, hey, you're going to see a great movie. But one, you know, afterwards, come on down to one hour tease on Damon Street. That's Chicago. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I want you to talk a little bit because there's some interesting stuff going on with you coming up um, as far as, you know, the, the rest. The, well, specifically the road wrestling, the wrestling road diaries two and one. And now you're coming out with three and you have some yeah. interesting stuff with Howl. So talk a little bit about Howl and how that that's going to work. So I made if, you don't, if you don't mind talking about it. Yeah, okay. I made this great relationship with Midroll. Like I've been with Midroll since basically the beginning. I'm not part of Earwolf, but I'm kind of part of that family, you know. Um, I am an independent podcast on my own, and Earwolf started Howl, which in their head is the Netflix so what did, of podcasting. was Earwolf at the time? What did Earwolf start off at? Was it an advertising no. company? No, it was a podcast network. Oh, podcast network, okay. Comedy Bang, Comedy Bang, Bang was their main one. Who Charted is one I listened to, Scarborough Country. Uh, how did this get made with Paul Shear and Jason Manzukis and June Diane Raphael? Very popular comedy podcasts. And Scott Ackerman's kind of Scott Ackerman's kind of in the world of comedy, like I am in in the world of wrestling. You know, like like everyone kind of knows who we are within that context of that world. Yeah. And and so uh, they started a subscription based model. It's got a paywall. It's four ninety nine a month, and it's got all the back catalogs of. Um, you know, I, I think they took the Marin approach of like just the last six months are available on iTunes. Then the back catalog is on Howl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For all the Earwolf shows. And I think they have like 30 or 40 of them. And then they have original content too, just like Netflix. So they reached out to me and they were like, do you have any original content? You know, we're starting this thing, but we don't, you know, so this guy's doing this and this guy's doing this. And I had, I had this audio documentary that I made and I sold them, um, 
which I sold it to them, which is uh, about the gathering of the Juggalos. Uh, I did that on a tour of Japan, like I sat on the bus and I edited it, <laughs> and I collected all the doc- I collected all the audio while at the gathering, just knowing I wanted to do something. How long was it? How long was that? The- an hour. It's an hour. Okay. It's an hour. Yeah, and um, and then they were like, "Do you have anything else?" And I had this idea for a storytelling podcast, which is called Pro Wrestling Fringe, and it's I because. I say I said like I said before I love the comedy podcast and now I found myself like I really like these uh, NPR Gimlet This American Life type shows whether Re- Reply All or um, you know Planet Money uh, I was on a, a podcast called Mystery Show which was very popular I think it was one or two for a while I really dig those and so I wanted to try my hand at those so like I do these uh, short stories about weird things in the past about pro wrestling it's called pro wrestling fringe and it's 10 minute little stories yeah and i and i and i put the music behind it and i tell a story mm. uh and you know one That's of them awesome. is about, one of them is about sputnik monroe who helped the desegregation in memphis wrestling in the um you know in the 50s i think uh you know one of them is about this uh the this wrestler who was seven foot six who uh ted turner um, he got drafted by the Atlanta Hawks. He was from Argentina, and he sucked at basketball, so they tried to make him a pro wrestler. <laughs> and it's just all these real fun stories. They're about ten minutes long, and I put those on Howl. And so um, that'll be the Wrestling Fringe. Yeah, it's called Pro Wrestling Fringe. Pro Wrestling Fringe. Yeah. Yeah, you can sign up for Howl. You get a free month with the offer code Colt. Uh, that way, you can just listen to it. And then I always tell my fans, like, "Hey, listen to it, and then just quit after a month. I don't care. Right. You know, like, try it, it out. Yeah, yeah, it's free. It's free." So uh, is it Howl.com or what's the website? Howl.fm. .fm, okay. Yeah, and it's an app. Howl.fm, all right. Yeah. I think your code and, for everything is Colt. So like one well, hour tease. Sometimes right? they put wrestling, yeah. Oh, really? Which I don't like. I think everything should be Colt, but sometimes they have wrestling. In Much it, easier. Yeah, I think so too. So then what's going to be coming out on Howl? So you have the new series. So I have three, I have three episodes already up. Okay. And now I have three new episodes. Yeah, I that see it right here. Colt Cabana's yeah. Pro Wrestling Fringe with the folding chair and the towel over it. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, and June, yeah, I hear Gathering of the Juggalos. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's awesome. So June twentieth. On June twentieth, we're going to be putting all my back catalog on Howl for the Art of Wrestling, and then also three new episodes of Pro Wrestling Fringe. And um, like I said, I use the offer code Colt, and uh, those are really fun. And so like that's like. That's like I've been doing my show Art of Wrestling for six years now, it's and crazy, so like, right? wow, I, I wanted, you know, like I not that like I I thought it'd be fun to do some, to use what I've learned with editing and techniques and just being in the podcasting industry uh, to try to touch upon something else, and so this is me, and this is something that I don't think is being done in wrestling. So when I started the one on one wrestler conversation podcast, it really wasn't done, and now. A lot of people are doing it, and now this post-produced style of podcasting yeah. is not is not done. You're going wrestling. to the next thing. Like at that point, that was new, exciting. No one was doing it. Now more and more people are doing this type of thing, and you're already looking at what's next. Yes, exactly. And yeah, the art of wrestling is my staple, and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon because yeah. I still enjoy doing it. But right, it's not. I'm not. It's not like it's ahead of the curve or anything. So yeah. you know, it, it's got its place. And so now this is kind of a, a new thing, and, and I can do this – again, I can do this while I'm on the road. I can write while I'm on the road, while I'm in the air, while I'm at a hotel. I only wrestle for 20 minutes a, a night. You know, I have a lot of time to – in between all that stuff. <laughs> so that's where I can do all this stuff. Yeah, but where you're there have- – you're probably there a few hours ahead. You're probably signing autographs and talking sure. to people and there afterwards too. Yeah, but during the day, you know, I got to work out, and then I've got all this time to do all this other stuff. And so so I, t- t- I got it done. What's your schedule look like for people? I mean, you are a professional athlete. I mean, you have to work out and you have to maintain your body. What What's your like workout in eating regimen? I mean, I'm always I'm ho- interested in the health <laughs> health related things. If I'm home from Monday to Thursday, let's say I'm home Monday to Thursday, and I'm on the road Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then I get home Monday night, like I'll try to work out. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then I'll try to find a day on the road somewhere to work out. So like that's when I get into the gym, yeah. and then like what's um, a workout like one hour, two hours, a yeah, half an hour. hour? Okay, I'll do cardio maybe in the beginning for uh, twenty twenty five minutes, and then I'll go work out a body part. Yeah, that's usually my um, that's my routine. You have a strict I'm, eating regimen. I mean, I I try not to eat like an asshole. That's what I tell people. <laughs> like you know, I don't know what that. I, 
Yeah, so no like, hot dogs is what you're saying? Like, yeah, what do you yeah, mean? yeah. You know, ch- like I, I'm, I have a very boring chicken and uh, protein bread and protein powders uh, routine. You know, high protein, low carb. Ch- stay away from sugar, uh, yeah. refined sugars, and um, you know, unnecessary uh, carbohydrates. And if I can keep on that, then that's kind of uh, that's a good routine yeah. for me. What you know, Colt? So for the podcast, right? Um, what has been I mean, it's obvious that the most popular episode was obviously with, with CM Punk, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was before CM Punk? What was the most popular episode before he came on? Um, there was a bunch. You know, it, it was when I got uh, – I had access – not access, but a lot of my friends were in WWE. And WWE didn't know what a podcast was. Yeah. So it just all went under the radar. And I was getting all these WWE wrestlers – and they weren't doing any other podcasts because no one knew what a podcast was. Yeah. And never had they heard a conversation like this, like that we would have. It's one thing to go into a radio station and do a 10-minute bumper, you know, like, hey, we're on the road this week. Come to Buffalo. It's going to be great, blah, blah, blah. But it's another thing to really dissect, like, why somebody gets into wrestling, what their motives are, yeah. uh, when they were scared, you know, to do whatever. And so those were the conversations I was having. So uh, there was a couple, you know, there, there was – uh, like the Miz was on, and William Regal. I had a two-part in- conversation with William Regal. That might have been the big one, was because uh, he's this like well-respected wrestler who was in WCW and WWE for years and didn't do a lot of stuff where he like, you know, like inside information stuff. And like he was a friend of mine, and he wanted to do it, and so yeah. then we did. It. And all of a sudden, like people were hearing these stories that they had never heard before, mm. and um, and were intrigued by, it and, and didn't know a lot of this information. So information was getting out there that they didn't know. Uh, was available to them before, and so yeah. a lot. And, and these guys are big stars. They see them, you know, they see them on television every single week. So to be able yeah. to have this access was unbelievable to a lot yeah. of people. That's when it started picking up. But but remember, uh, uh, Punk was on the second episode ever. So while he was like the champion, so that was a big boost too. You know, yeah. like second. But like the podcast wasn't ready to be good then. You know why? Because <laughs> I, I was finding myself. I yeah. was finding out how to do it. I wasn't in a groove. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just kind of, it was in a real figure out process, yeah, not, yeah. Necessarily, not necessarily in the conversations, uh, the conversations were good, but the equipment and the editing, all the and technical all stuff. stuff and the technical stuff. Yeah. yeah it, was, it wasn't good yet. With the, um, CM Punk, when did you first meet him? Uh, we were, um, I was 18. He was 19. I mean, was this in Ring of Honor or where, where did you? In Chicago. We trained together. Yeah. yeah. Did you know, like, when you guys, obviously there's a lot of people who don't make it or don't continue with it. At that point, did you know each other was going to be higher and that you were talented? Is that, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I just, it just all kind of went on, like, we were just doing it. I was just doing it. I was just trying to wrestle. You know, it wasn't like a goal to make it to WWE or whatever. It was just like wrestling, doing it, doing what we wanted to do. Yeah. And eventually, eventually, it was like, we can do this for a living. I can do this for a living. That's kind of all I saw it as. Like, I just want to keep on doing this for a living. Like, it's not about going to WWE. It's not about getting a podcast. It's not about, uh, you know, it's it's not about being a TV star or a movie star. It's just about being able to do this thing and not have to do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I also don't want to, you know, you're a good conversationalist and these people, you know, intimately. So for people who are podcasting, have there been any points where there were, I don't know, I don't know, low moments of a podcast, but, uh, <laughs> mishaps or like, uh, embarrassing moments? Uh, I mean, like, so I did an episode with Bill Goldberg, who's a very famous wrestler, yeah. and we had had this kind of interact. First of all, we're two of the highest profile Jewish wrestlers. Him, way more high profiler. But there's not many Jewish wrestlers, so I <laughs> therefore I'm a high profile Jewish wrestler. And uh, we had had this weird interaction on Twitter, and like we and like you know he would retweet and, and favorite some of my stuff, and then we kind of started talking, and it was like, hey, would you want to do a podcast with me? He's like, yeah. So I felt I had this internet relationship with him, right. good enough to get on there. And then when we did it, he was very standoffish and it was very awkward. And um, it was a little disappointing for me um, as a podcaster because it's, it is based on this this relationship that we had. Yeah. And I thought, and I, me as a wrestler and, and as a comedian too, like 
I love this fun loving, free flowing, good time having conversation. Yeah. And it wasn't there. And then so it turned kind of into an interview, which I didn't want it to. Uh, Less of I a conversation, to... more of an interview type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's where a lot of them will go maybe weird or wrong, like you said, is when it turns into a straight interview. Yeah. Do you For think me, that's I... just his persona or do you think that he was maybe just having an off day or something like that? No, I think it's persona. Yeah. yeah. I, I... But so I didn't realize because a... I didn't know him that much. You know? That's a great point, though, Colt, because that's tough. You know, I know being on this end, and you know that when that happens, like, how do you turn someone around to get that to be more of a conversation? Because that's how you naturally go. But if the person's kind of seeing it as formal, or you know, how do you help turn them around so that you get that report? I try to use. I try to use my witty charm. Yeah, doc. You know, that's what I do. Like. Uh, I try to throw in a joke that I know isn't offensive, that lightens the mood. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I try to show the best I can with the skills that I've learned just as being yeah. a human being to try to lighten the mood and try to get a little hey, hey, hey going. And that's the best I can do. And, I, and I'll yeah. probably fight that for the whole hour. <laughs> like, like, I won't stop doing that and just be like, okay, Until next they question. open up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, try, I'll fight with them to get it done. You know, and that's, part of the, that's part of the reason why also, like, when you know the po- doing a podcast, I believe is not about your guests. Like the guest is a great like dessert. Like it's about like you want these fans to love you, the human being. So the, it's such a treat that you, that human being, are now talking to somebody else that you like, not someone else you like is on a show. Like you, you want them to click in for you every single week and nobody yeah. else. Yeah, that's the most important thing that I found is I can't be dependent on my guests. I get great guests, and I realize the value of great guests. But yeah. most importantly, I want this listener to be a fan of mine. Yeah. So even if there is no guests, yeah. they get to hear me for an hour. What a treat. Yeah, yeah. So big lessons to the podcast community. You're, um, I think, are you doing the awards ceremony at Podcast Movement? Or what do you What do yeah, you Yeah, last, last year I did the pod- awards at Podcast Movement in Dallas. And it was like so much fun. Uh, like they wanted like uh, Dan, the guy who's kind of who's kind of running it, he wanted – Kind of like a more like, hey, showmanship type of thing as as less like less of like a square guy, I guess, you know. And so he's like, oh, pro wrestler would be he great. you, yeah. That's yeah, perfect. You know? <laughs> and like I'm in the podcast world and obviously, you know, there's a little razzmatazz to me. And uh, the, uh, the best compliment, the best compliment I got was at, when Adam Curry came up to me, the pod father. I don't know if you know your podcasting history. <laughs> Adam Curry is known as the pod father. MTV's Adam Curry, right? You know him? Yeah, yeah. Big hair. He likes. He like is known as like the guy that started the first podcast. I didn't know that he, though. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Wow. Google that guy. All right. And, um. He was just like, "You're great." He's like, "I've been to so many of these, and they're so boring and dumb and dull." He's like, "You're great. This is so amazing. This is like, this is flowing. That's all you could ever ask for." And I was like, "Podfather, thank you so much. Podfather, <laughs> to have your blessing." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so this year is in Chicago, and uh, I think it's the sixth through the eighth. And like I only got to do the awards last year, and I didn't get to stay for the next two days, and I was like kicking myself because there was like why? Because you had a show. Did you have a wrestling? Show I had to go wrestle. I had to go on the yeah, road. Yeah. yeah. And this week, this year, they're during the week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and like I'm able to, to stay for like. There's going to be all these like last year there were all these um, unbelievable people from the world of podcasting, and there was all these seminars and all this stuff, and like I was kicking myself that I didn't get to take advantage of any of it. So this year, I'm so happy that it's in. Basically, it's around the corner from yeah. where I'm at. And I get to go to all these things. And, You're going to go to all of it? Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Like, just, you know, I get it for free. So it's like, <laughs> right. you know, I could just take advantage of it. Why would I not take advantage of all of it? So big as, lessons. As, what were you going to say? As, as a, not like as a, hey, I have a podcast, but like I want to learn. Right, of learn. course. Yeah. So what are some of the big lessons? You know, obviously that's why we talked. Obviously, I'm intrigued by your story. I only know bits and pieces now. I know a lot more, and it gave me a chance to actually study you as a specimen for the last few days. Um, but big lessons that you're like, Jeremy, you need to include this in in your talk to uh, the podcast, whether advanced or beginner or whoever. What what are some of the big lessons um, that are important to you? Like that one you just said, I thought was brilliant, actually. Um, you don't think of that with interview shows of people are showing up for you, so make sure that you're bringing it and they get to know you. So it's a different mentality. But I have that on the – a lot of that is in – well, a lot of that they know me as wrestlers, but a lot of that front monologue is very important where they mm-hmm. like 
that's where they learn because you you also don't want to like it's the interview is for or the conversation is it's their time to shine you know yeah. like this is a spotlight on that person right so it, you can't cut them off too much you know yeah uh, so there is that fine line of like be, showing your personality but also letting them that person spotlight mm-hmm. but i think we hit a hit a lot, a lot a lot of the lessons i i guess like yeah i, I don't know i think we i don't know yeah i, I mean they'll, they'll come to me as they come to me but yeah. you know yeah. you touch on them and we'll hit them no i think this you know Clyde, i really appreciate it this has been fantastic anything else um that we haven't talked about with the merchandise or maybe upcoming shows. What's what's on the horizon? Uh, I, I will. Can, can, I'll give you another lesson. Though, yeah, actually. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, consistency. Consistency. Hell yeah, yeah. Is the most important thing. My show comes out every single Thursday. It has for the last six years. The people know that. They even if they don't subscribe or they lose their their thing or they they you know. Sometimes now with like like Hulu and all this stuff, like I'm and like I just cut my cord on my cable. Like I'm not sure what time some of my favorite shows that I used to watch are on. I don't have DVR anymore, so I kind of forgot, you know. But I know these; they know every single Thursday there will be an episode for me, and I won't let them down. And so that's how you gradually, gradually gain this audience slowly and surely. Is you know it'll always go up if you're consistent with you know with your work and everything. But also like the time uh, that your show comes out in the day and, and that kind of stuff. It's very yeah. important is to get that schedule. Make it scheduled listening. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, that's uh, – my friend Stu Stone was like – he told me that. And um, not that I didn't know that, but he like reiterated it. He had done a show. He had done a live webcam show called The Sunday Night Stew for years. Every single Sunday, everyone knew, hey, I got to go and see that. And then he, he also has a podcast, TSM Radio, that comes out every Tuesday too. Same way. Um, in terms of me – uh, right, I need to put it out because I'm always hustling. I'm always pushing something. So yeah. I, you know, Wrestling Road Diaries three is coming out soon. September first is when we're going to ship it. Uh, I have a merch store, ColtMerch.com, or just everything's available at ColtCabana.com. Well, it's ColtMerch.com, I think. Colt, it, it, yeah. it forwards when you go to the ColtCabana.com and you go to the the merchandise. It goes to ColtMerch.com. Yeah, but that was another thing that was important. Like I learned, had to learn like that. Make sure everything is at ColtCabana.com. So they can, like, you know, I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of websites and a lot of things. You do? Like, yeah, yeah. A ton of websites. But And WrestlingRoadDiaries.com is another one. But, like, you can all get it. At, if, if I only have one second to right. send someone somewhere, ColtCabana.com. And so a lot of people are ditching the Facebook and their Twitter. You know, or they're ditching uh, a website for Facebook or for Twitter or for Snapchat. But I think there's something in that hub of just, you know, that, that hub of ColtCabana.com. You can go to com. one place. Yeah, which will take you everywhere um, for whatever you want. Wrestling Road Diaries 3, it's called Fun Equals Money. It's a look at the inside look at comedy wrestling. And uh, and a lot of the psychology talk that we talked about, which has never, I felt, really been documented before. Yeah. Um, we document the psychology of why we do stuff in, in a wrestling match and why we liked it and why we didn't like it as a performer. Hmm. And it, that's all done through comedy it's wrestling. It's like the behind-the-scenes inside like look at... At the stuff, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what the road diaries are. It's yeah, a, it's a behind the scenes look. Yeah, yeah. and um, and although comedy wrestling might sound funny and silly, and when we're performing, it's all laughs. You'd be interested to see like what's going through our minds as performers yeah. um, outside of the ring. And so that's the third installment of the Wrestling Road Diaries, uh, and that's available at coldcommander dot com. And then I just yeah, I've I've all the I've shows everywhere every single weekend. You're going to um, Ireland. You're going, going to, to Ireland, Ireland, right? I'm going to Ireland at the end of June. I'm going to Edinburgh uh, all of August. Wow. Uh, I'm going to That's London cool. at the end of July. Jeez. Uh, I, last year, I did four tours of Japan. I did about three months of Japan. And, um, yeah, I, I just travel the world as a wrestler. Uh, I, and, like, every little small town, anywhere, anywhere lives, I've probably been there, you know. So any people in mind for future guests that you want on, the Art of Wrestling? Or yeah, you, I'm always the, like I who, always have it. It's yeah, always who? going through my head, and it's like the hardest thing ever. And that's the if you want to know the only stress and the only reasons why sometimes I'm like I can't handle this is the idea <laughs> that I have to like map out who's going to be where I've been and if I've had I've had so many people and I've had over three over three hundred episodes. It's yeah. like I'll go to these shows where back in the day I'd go to these shows and be like I can have that guy or that guy. Hey, you want to be on my show? Hey, now it's like fuck, I've had everybody. 
So that's yeah. a lot of stress of like having to have people. Who on do my you show. want? Who do you want? Any any uh, top five list of no? There's just guys that I'll go and I'll, like I, that I know I'll be shows. You know, I'll have shows with and I'll have them on eventually. And I, I do live shows too, which are a lot of fun, which helps break up the monotony too. So like, just this, these past two weeks, I did a live show in Cleveland. I did a live show in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I did them in conjunction with the pro wrestling show. So it's not about making You mean you did a live game. interview? Is that what you mean? Before the show? Well, or what? Yeah, I had an audience. Yeah. And then, and then I would bring up like five. Like I'd, I'd say to all the – I'd have five wrestlers on. I'd say, hey, we're going to just chat for 10 minutes. And so that way I make an hour show because I have five wrestlers on, 10 minutes each. And then yeah. I do a pre and a post live there. Yeah. But that turns more into a, almost um, – I have to explain to them that that's kind of more of a talk show. Less of an, in, an intimate, like um, deep down look at our souls, yeah. uh, where it's like I'm looking for kind of laughs and entertainment with the crowd. But I love doing those because if I've had, let's say I've had you on my show as a wrestler, I'm not going to have you on again probably, but I want you to be on so you can plug stuff. So these live shows are a great way to have returning guests on for like little ways and plug stuff and yeah. um, let people know what's going on. Yeah. So, Colt, I always ask since this is Inspired Insider. And two things. One, what's been the lowest moment and what's been the proudest moment? Uh, what's been the lowest moment and how you push through? Uh, being fired from WWE. was That was my dream. That's what I worked for for yeah. years to get there. And um, there were so many aspects to what, like, it was such a big machine and it was such a big, like, the way they worked. It was such a giant corporation that they, you know, it, it made me realize how, if I ran a business, how I wouldn't want to run a business. And essentially now I run a business. Yeah. What's an just, example? What do you mean? What was one thing that you did? You just, wanted to do the opposite. And if you get in trouble for saying it, you know, don't say it, obviously. But it, but. It's like, I don't think they got to know their talent well enough. They hired these people and they, they, gave, they gave them the idea of like, you might be like, we know you're good enough to, you know, and eventually be a millionaire and a billionaire. And then they didn't get to know the people who they were inside. And it's a little bit of what inspired me to do the the podcast. It's like I want to I want people to know who these people really are. And I didn't feel that you know, Vince McMahon I had a five minute conversation with the guy below him I had a you know, didn't even talk to ever, and that was the guy who fired me. You know what I'm saying? So it's like they didn't even know who I was. Yeah. And I'd worked so hard, I'd worked ten years to get to that point. And right. all it took was somebody looking on the thing going, Who's that guy? And someone else going, Oh, I don't know. And then then I was fired the next day. And they didn't know all this stuff that I could bring to the table, to which I eventually brought to the table for myself. Right. So it's almost like, in one question, the lowest point was what brought me to my highest point. Yeah. Because I realized that there was, I had value that no one else was going to realize that I was the only one that was able to bring it to the table and show the world is if I did it myself. And I made it, I, I, I realized, I came to this, like, it was a wake up call that, like, no one's going to want to you to be the best you can be, except you. You're the only, you're the only one, you have the most you know, invested in you. And of course, you know, and I don't blame those guys. Like they're looking out for their own thing. Right. Of course. Now I'm looking out for my own thing and that's me and my industry and in my business. And like, I know like I want to be nicer to people below me, but there's really nobody below me. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of just me. And so the, so this idea that I've done this kind of, you know, with the help of all the fans and everything, but like, you know, I've just, I've done this kind of myself cause I believed in myself the most. And that was, Thanks to the wake up call to the to my dream being taken away from me and now realizing that like I had different dreams and I have different aspirations. How did they do they give you even give you a reason when it happened? They gave me a, a, a stock line that they were giving everyone at the time, which is called creative has nothing for you, which is the, their creative team comes up with ideas and they say, sorry, creative has nothing for you. So, you know, you can see on YouTube. Uh, me and my friend Marty DeRosa, we started a web series called Creative Has Nothing For You. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's, um, you know, it's a comedy, mm. it's a comedy show about different, you know, it's about me, the wrestler talking mm. to the management. Marty plays the management. And, um, and that's kind of how I went into all of it. Like I went into it. You could tell, like just that idea, like you could tell I was pissed off and I was like ready to, I had a chip on my shoulder yeah. and I was going to, but I was going to use comedy as like my defense mechanism. And that's kind of like how I've worked like this whole thing. Like, and, and, and I was driven to like prove people wrong, you know, 
And just in the idea that they that's how they fired me, saying creative has nothing for you. And then I started a web series that's that's called Creative Has Nothing For You. <laughs> kind of sums it up. <laughs> what is it like when you get there though? You know, because yeah, you, you get called up to the the big leagues, right? WWE. Because I remember yeah. you it was in Kentucky, right? Or Yeah, they moved me to Louisville. Because I think and- I was in Louisville at the same time, maybe around the same time and um, you knew you had just moved back, but you knew the area very well. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they moved me to Louisville and then they moved me to Tampa. And like those were their developmental leagues. So they signed me to a contract. The day they offered me a contract was one of the greatest days of my life. Yeah. And but then I knew like there was a lot of work going forward. And then the day I had my debut match, I that feeling cannot be taken away from me. Everything mm-hmm. afterwards was was awful. Yeah. You know, it wasn't good. My career did not go well. But the idea that they were like, Colt, you're on the team. It's amazing. Go yeah. have your first match. You know, it was such a wonderful, um, such a wonderful feeling for me, and that feeling was great. You know, a lot of stuff around it wasn't, but I'll always have that specific feeling. Yeah, yeah. So you would say that would be the proudest moment after, you know, turning that, you know, um, the creative nothing for you and your podcast. What, what uh, has been one of the prouder moments? I mean, it's all just like it's not like, and I think that's the most important thing is that like I don't. You can't just define like once you do something, you then you got to move on to the next thing. Like you can't. There's not like one big. Like I've had a lot of, of wonderful moments. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I wrestled one of my heroes, Johnny Saint, in England. Uh, you know, in front of a thousand people, in Sheffield, England. He was yeah. six. He was sixty eight at the time, and uh, he was a guy who I love and loved. And then I had him on my podcast. That was a proud moment yeah. too. You know, yeah. uh, you know, maybe getting a nice. My, my my proudest moment is is being able to eat every day. Is every day I go out mm. and I and I and I buy my lunch, or I pay my you know my bills, and I'm doing that without even really doing a job. Like I I have money because I do what I do. That's what makes me proud. Yeah. You rock, Colt. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I am. I'm not uh... the rock. I'm Colt. <laughs> Different guy. Different guy. Damn, I've been, I've been doing way this all story. wrong. Yeah, way better story than I have. <laughs> way more money. Thanks, Cole. I really appreciate it. I will see you at Podcast Movement or before. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thanks Go much. to... ColeCommanda.com, at ColeCommanda on Twitter, at ColeCommanda on Instagram. I had a Vine that went viral. It had 10 million loops. You can go see that. What is it? I put a sticker on a bodybuilder wrestler friend of mine, and he couldn't get it, and everyone laughed, and then stole it. <laughs> World Star Hip World Star Hip Hop stole it. Uh, buy some merch and come to a local show. And uh, uh, podcast wise, listen to my podcast, Art of Wrestling, on iTunes, and uh, check out uh, Howl.fm and uh, just give it a shot for a moment. And YouTube channel, uh, Colt Commander on Wrestling, but you can find that through ColtCommander.com. All right. Yeah, I have a week. I have a weekly. I have a weekly uh, YouTube series. It's called Worst Promo Ever. It's hilarious. Where, where it's um, normally the guy, the wrestler gets interviewed. And I pretend like I'm the dumbest wrestler of all time. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> and that way, I also I'm promoting my upcoming show through that, so people know what show I'm going to and who I'm wrestling. So yes, it's a lot. There's a lot behind why I do it. I suggest everyone check out Worst Promo Ever. It is actually hilarious. So, I get. I think we get all the plugs in. We did it. Amen. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other. Just you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand